Well, hello, local church. Happy Thanksgiving. Oh, that was weak, but thank you very much. I appreciate that. Appreciate the, the return. I'll try it one more time. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Ah, that's a lot better. Thank you. If you're fairly new here, my name is Robert Emmett. I'm Chris's older brother. And... Uh, <laughs> Really older, old enough to be his dad, in fact, which I am. But hey, how many of you went to the city center tree lighting last night? Oh, yeah. That was amazing. That city center is a beautiful place. I mean, you got that big bowl. You can have some, a lot of services, a lot of cool stuff there. So anyway, I went, was happy to go, and was very proud of Chris. He was the MC, and, and um, he led us in a rousing chorus of jingle bells. And he did it, you know, in deals, it was jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun. And you said, well, I didn't know Chris could sing. He can't. <laughs> he proved it to everybody last night, but you got to give him points for guts. I mean, he stood up there and sung to the multitudes, but really nice, really enjoyed being there. So glad to be able to preach with you today. Hello to all of you online. Uh, people watch your services all over the place. My wife and I and my father-in-law watch from Fort Collins at 7.30 in the morning. So it's nice. That's our, our little uh, small group, you might say. But online people, welcome. Glad you're checking it out. And people that are here in person, glad to have you as well. So I'm going to speak on a subject today since it's Thanksgiving and a happy time of the year. Uh, the message is entitled, Depression, Suicide, and Happiness. <laughs> my shirt says it all, Okay. Depression, suicide, and happiness. I know you're thinking, no, really, what are you preaching on? No, really, that's it. Depression, suicide, and happiness. Why? Well, it's in the Bible. Depression's a reality of life. How many people here, other than myself, have been through clinical depression and know the darkness in the corners there? Raise your hand if you would. Very good. Welcome, fellow sufferers. And yet we're alive and well and smiling about it. And I'm wearing a smiley shirt. And those of you that are going through it are going, how did you get there? Tell us. That's what I'm here for. I am. Be patient. Stay with me. It's going to be a happy message. A little low at some points, but it's going to end happily ever after. Does that sound good? Depression. What is it? Here's my definition. I know they call it mental illness and all that stuff. That sounds so clinical and bad and terminal and permanent. De here it is. Depression is a worn out brain. Depression is a worn out brain brain. Let's try that little singing thing now. You say depression, you say is a, and you say worn out brain, okay? So Chris, if you're watching, I learned this from you. Depression is a worn out brain. Depression is a worn out brain. Man, you sound, you really got the right part. I mean, you lowered your voice. Worn out brain. <laughs> That's all it is. I know you're thinking, oh, there's more to it than that. Oh, gosh, yes. But it's a worn out brain. The serotonin and dopamine have burned out. You've used it all up. That's the chemicals in your brain that you use to solve problems, speak, sing, write, do all of that stuff. That's what goes there. We use them every day for everyday causes. But sometimes something really big hits our lives. It's long. It's disappointing. It's scary. It's dreadful. It's a divorce. It's a death. It's a disaster. You lost your job. Something bad has shaken your mind up to where your mind is just worried about it, worried about it, worried about it, worried about it, thinking about it, what if this happened, what if this, and you play it all. And you don't sleep because you burned all that stuff up. So you go to bed at 10.30 or 11 at night. You wake up at 2, 2.30. You start thinking again, and you don't sleep. You think, well, that's it. That's it. You're wearing out your brain. You say, that sounds really simple. It really is. God designed it that way. We just discovered it's called serotonin and dopamine and those things. But three or 4,000 years ago, when God was putting the Bible together for us, did you know the one command he gives us more than any other is, worry not, fear not, don't be afraid? 400 times God tells his people, don't worry, don't be afraid. I got this, trust me. It's not always going to be good, but hang in there. It's going to get better. Trust me, trust me, trust me. Fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. Because God knew a long time ago that we tend to worry about everything, and if it's a disaster, we dread, and it just burns it up, and eventually, if you don't reboot it, you're flatlined, and that's depression. Everybody gets sad and down. I mean, if your team lost yesterday, you know, is this depression? No. You know, you live in Seattle right now, November to March. Boy, talk about seasonal depression. They go to work in the dark. They come home in the dark, 
And when they have a weekend, it's cloudy and rainy. Ugh, what do they do? They go over the mountains to Spokane, or they go south. But it's, uh, if you've ever been in Seattle during this fall and want to, ooh, it's, uh, it's hard to be happy up there. But that's seasonal. It goes with it. All of us have down days, down a few days, maybe a down week or two. None of that is what we call clinical depression. Clinical depression is when you're down and you're down for the count and nothing is bringing you back up. A lot of tests out there, you can Google them. One that I used years ago uh, was this one. So I'll put it on the screen and take a picture of it. It's for you to evaluate yourself or somebody else. I've been praying for you. And when Chris said, what are you preaching on? I said, Psalms 143, depression. He said, okay, great. And then as I came up with a message, I said, you know, maybe we shouldn't advertise this the Sunday before Thanksgiving. Hey, come here, an awesome message on depression, suicide, and happiness. So you're here because I said, Lord, please send the people that need to be here, either the ones that are hurting and going through it so they can get some help, or the ones that are healthy so they can recognize it in others and be the person in their life to help them. So here we go, a little simple depression test. Uh, feel free to elbow the person you're with. That's a, perfectly fine because one of the big things of depression is I'm not. Yeah, you are. I'm not. So if you're getting elbowed today, you are. Pay attention. Number one, constant feelings of sadness or anxiety. Constant. Not now and then, all the time. Number two, loss of interest in daily pleasures. Uh, your pickleball game just doesn't do it for you anymore. Your steak and potatoes doesn't work anymore. You take a nice long walk and you go play golf and it's just nothing is bringing you joy and happiness. Dopamine, the happy chemical, isn't there. Number uh, three, changes in appetite. I know it's Thanksgiving, so don't let that one scare you. We're talking about really major changes, and we're all going to you know, beef it up this week. But you're not eating like you used to be, or you're eating way more than you used to be, one or the other. Serious changes in appetite is what we're looking at. Number four, insomnia, can't sleep, or oversleeping. I guess insomnia is you can't sleep, and oversleeping is you can't get up. Either way, serious change in your sleep patterns makes a big difference. Number five, fatigue, no energy. En no le you don't want to walk, you know you should, all the things I could say, numbers one and two, but now you have no energy and now you're fatigued. Number six, restless or irritable. And I know you're elbowing your husband, irritable, that's you. If he's always been that way, it's not depression. Okay, so give the guy a break. He's just naturally grumpy. So... So, fellas, you're, you appreciate that one, right? Or the ladies, but, you know, normal grumpiness. But we're looking for that happy person that's suddenly just snapping and going off. And, man, you're biting everybody's head off and you're just so tense and all of that. Pay attention to the signs. Number seven, feelings of worthlessness, hopelessness. I'm a failure. I'm no good. I'll never do it. I can't keep a relationship, whatever it might be. But something drives you down. Number eight, no concentration or decision-making. You can't finish a book, you can't write a sermon, you can't do whatever you do, you can't make decisions all of a sudden. Man, I used to just be so concise, now I can't. What's wrong with me? You're out of gas. You're out of the stuff that keeps you normal. You need help. Number eight, or no, nine, number nine, suicidal thoughts or plans. Most people that in their lives have gone through a spell of clinical depression, they did not get help, they did it their own, they were isolated, and they reach a point where it's useless, I'll never get out of this, I'm better off dead. I'm a 55-year-old man, I've been demoted, I don't make the money I used to, my kids are grown and gone, the family would be better off without me, at least the life insurance would pay off. I'm an addict and I've fallen off the wagon so many times, I've just fell off it again, I will never overcome this, what's the use? I'm a teenager. I have been slandered on social media. I've been bullied. I've been victim. I've been canceled. They're saying lies about me to so many people that I can't stop, and they end their lives. I have a friend. She lost her nine-year-old granddaughter this year to suicide because of depression. Let me repeat that. You should be going, oh, or hurt. A nine-year-old girl ended her life because somewhere in her music, her friends, her TikTok, or whatever she was listening to, Something said, if this and this and this is happening, then it's useless and it's hopeless. I don't know the story behind it. I just know it broke my heart when I heard it. A nine-year-old girl should be going to school, playing, singing, dancing, whatever nine-year-olds do. You shouldn't be thinking life isn't worth living at nine years old. That's not normal. If you hear a child, a teenager, or an adult throw out that life's not worth living, you better pay attention. Because when you're normal, you don't say stuff like that. You're not having a great day and go, you know, it's been a great day, but I don't think life's worth living. That doesn't happen. 
That's why you got to pay attention to the symptoms. And then the last symptom up there was number 10, and that was uh, numbers 1 and 2 plus 5 or more for at least two weeks. Okay? Seasonal, up and down, bad day, bad week, don't worry. I mean, you'll get through it. When it's lasting two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, when people are kind of distancing and people start asking, are you all right? Are you all right? You're not yourself these days. How long have you not been yourself? Two weeks or more? It's time to get some help. It's time to go to a doc or an urgent care or a nurse or a counselor or a psychologist. Time to get help. If you're the one hurting, I'm going to throw it out there, but I know you're not going to do it. You know, get help. If you're the one that's helping, do not tell the one that's going through depression, oh, you, you just get, I've got to get over it. You've got to think on all the good stuff. Look at this. You're successful. You've got a great marriage. You've got wonderful kids. You're successful in business. I mean, there's no reason for you to be the way you are. That's what people that have never had depression say to people that have had depression. And all those that have had depression said, amen, amen. yeah. I mean, yeah, it makes sense. I shouldn't be like this, but I am. No matter what you say, cranks it up. It's like having a Ferrari in your garage and there's no gas in the tank and you're trying to start it. It's out of gas. Somebody comes along and says, well, you just need to turn the ignition. I did. Well, turn it again. Just keep cranking it. It's out of gas. I know it's out of gas, but you just need to keep cranking. What's that? Well, now you got a dead battery. You're out of gas. you got a dead battery. You're flatlined. Pick your metaphor. That's what it is. That's clinical depression. You don't have to stay there. I've been there. I'll tell you about it in a second. But I'm standing here in front of you with a yellow T-shirt. You say, what's that about? I want to get you from this, which we'll look at in a second, through this to this. How many of you would like to be this? All right. Would you like the skinny version of that? <laughs> or the, the, the old man version of that? Okay, either way, we're going to get you there. Notice the smile doesn't change. It's you know, fat or skinny. You take your choice. <laughs> Some of your favorite singers, actors, musicians, preachers, writers, whatever it might be, many of them, more than the norm because of their position, suffer secretly with depression, clinical depression. Matthew Perry is just the most recent example, uh, but there's, you're out here and you go, no way, that's a comedian, he's my favorite comedian, he's hilarious. Yeah, but they get up for that moment, they do what they do, but then they go home and there's isolation and loneliness and the depression sets in, and then they wonder, what's wrong with me? I'm a comedian. I make people laugh. Why aren't I laughing? Because you're clinically depressed, and you don't go to local church to know how to fix it. But you go to local church, so now you know, right? Hello? All right, very good. Uh, one of my friends, he went through pretty serious depression. I don't know if it was depression, probably not a clinical depression, but it was a moment in his life that was so full of dread he knew it was going to happen. He couldn't stop it from happening, and he tried everything he could. He even prayed to God and got a no for his answer. His name is Jesus. And the night before he was crucified, he got his best friends and said, come pray with me in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he prayed, and he prayed hard, and he said, Father, please let this cup of death pass away from me. Don't make me go through this, because Jesus, being God, on earth, knew what was going to happen the next day. You and I found out about it later, but he was about to go into it. And he said, Lord, please, not this. God said, no, son, you got to go through it. Talked to his disciples, woke him up. They weren't much help at that point. He went back, he prayed a second time, a third time. Each time God said, no, you have to go through it. A lot of people get mad at God because they get unanswered prayers. Listen, Jesus himself, God on earth, he got told no with his prayers. A lot of people decide not to believe in God. Well, I prayed to God and it didn't happen, so I don't believe he's out there. Well, you need to read the Bible because you discover some of the greatest people didn't get the prayers they asked for. We get told yes, yay. We get told no, boo. Then we get told nothing. Ah, so what happens to everybody? One of the characters in the Bible that is a man after God's own heart, his name is David. I know you all been going through Psalms and when Chris called me and asked if I'd preach, I said, Sure. He said, you can pick between chapters 142 and 150. And I read them all and said, Lord, what am I supposed to speak on? He said, well, you know. I said, yeah, I know, but is, could I do one of the others? He said, no. I said, but that one's such a downer, and it's a Sunday before Thanksgiving. He said, yeah, I know, but that's what you're preaching. And uh, yes, sir. I mean, I've learned not to argue too much. I do knock on the door a couple of times. You sure? You sure? Even Gideon did that. Even Jesus did it. 
Are you sure? Are you sure? And so, yes, I'm sure. So chapter 143, David. David was the Taylor Swift of his day. <laughs> he was extremely popular, famous, loved by all, except the king that he was supposed to replace. And that king was like Donald Trump. He just would not go away. <laughs> and you think Donald's hung around a long time. King Saul hung around about 15 years and made life miserable for David. David's trying to be nice to him. They both know God has said David's the next king. David's playing a song at dinner time, and Solomon just gets full of the devil. Throws a spear at David. David misses it. <laughs> hits the wall. And David says, you know, this plan probably isn't working. I'll sneak on out. And he was on the run for 15 years. Not a few days, not a few weeks, about 15 years, 10 to 15 years. He got to a point where he was tired of running. He wasn't getting answers to prayers. And he writes this psalm, and it's the lowest moment in his life. It is that flat out, down and out, it's over, nothing's changing, nothing's working. So let's walk through that verse by verse together and see what was going on in David's life. 143.1. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my plea. Answer me because you are faithful and righteous. He's right. He's going to God. But remember, not everybody that prays gets exactly what they wanted. David, verse 2. David said, don't put your servant on trial for no one is innocent before you. In other words, I am guilty. I have sinned. I have made mistakes. I've made bad calls. Lord, I am guilty. Guilt is a heavy burden. When you know you're guilty, you broke the law, you got caught, whatever it is, you'd like to blame somebody else, but in your heart, you know, you know, that's my bad. That one's on me. That's why the Bible says, Jesus said, confess your sins, and he will be faithful to forgive you of those things. If you hang on to your sins, like with David, it just becomes a weight. Man, I'm making bad decision after bad decision. Verse 3, my enemy has chased me. He has knocked me to the ground and forces me to live in darkness like those in the grave. He's got enemies. He's got personal attacks. You've read the story of David, or if you haven't, it's in Samuel. Uh, and it's his story, and the king is chasing him, trying to kill him. Two or three times, David had a chance to kill Solomon, but he did, Saul, but he didn't, because he said, I'm not going to lift my hand up against the Lord's king. And he did the right things, and yet God didn't reward him. It wasn't, great job, David. You're out of there. You're the new guy in. He is struggling. He is being slandered. He is being attacked. It'd be like you, personal attacks, uh, social media attacks, uh, people at work, they don't like you, you got the promotion, they didn't, so they're bad-mouthing and all that stuff. Personal attacks, genuine, real people that don't like you and are telling lies about you and slandering you. That's a reality in life. It was a reality for, for David. He got tired of it. Verse 4, he said, I am losing all hope. I am paralyzed with fear. There is hopelessness, isolation, fear. Hopeless. I've been trying to do things right. It's been years. He's still king. I'm still not. He's in the palace. I'm running for my life in the woods and the mountains and the caves. He's getting tired. You get tired. We all get tired. But you reach that point to where I'm hopeless. I'm worthless. If you hear yourself saying that, I'm no good. I'll never amount to anything. I'm not my big brother. I'm not my big sister. I'm not this or that. I'm just a loser. When you hear that, pay attention. Number five, verse five, I remember the days of old. I ponder all your great works and think about what you have done. You go, well, that's a good one. Uh, sort of, a, you, you got to read between the lines. What he's saying is, Lord, you are awesome. You've done incredible things. I'm not. I'm the loser. I'm out here on the run. I'm hiding in the caves. Nothing is going right for me. I've been voted by God to be king, and yet I'm hiding in the caves. And that's that I'm worthless. I'm no good. It can happen to a child, a teenager, an adult. We get it enough, but what's really bad is when a parent or grandparent or somebody else keeps telling the child, you're not as smart as they are, you're not as fast, you're not as strong, you're never going to amount to anything. Where on earth, well, I know where that came from, came from the pits of hell. But if you're one of those parents that's telling your child, you'll never do this or that or that, man, bad parenting, stop. It's not a parenting message. That was a free point for you. Go ahead and write it down. Yeah, let's see. Number six, I lift up my hands to you in prayer. Yay! I thirst for you as... Parched land, thirst for rain. Lifting up my hands in prayer, but I'm not getting answers to prayer. I am dry, I am empty, I am burned out. I am flatlined, I am depressed. Verse 7. Key, the lowest verse in the whole Psalms. Come quickly, Lord, and answer me, for my depression deepens. 
don't turn away from me or I will die. Man after God's own heart, future king of Israel, killer of Goliath, loved by everybody. They were singing songs about David to Saul's chagrin. He was famous. He was great. He shared his personal life like Taylor. He wrote a bunch of songs about the ups and downs of his life, uh, not his dating life. That's another book. <laughs> but he wrote about his struggles and happy times and bad times. Sometimes you read David and those songs are his journal. Great things and he's just hallelujah. But now this is the lowest verse he writes. Come quickly, Lord. Don't desert me for I will die. Depression, if you don't check it, Sometimes you grow through it. I've had doctor friends that said, I said, what did people do in the old days when they called it melancholy? It wasn't anything to do. He said, they just kind of checked out of life and you left them alone. And they said, eventually, nine months, a year, you kind of come out of it and you go. But he said, we got stuff that helps you get out of that sooner. So that's the good news for us. So I want you to know David got to that point where he says, I am at the point of death. Lord, if you don't do something, I mean, that's low tell you a story about a guy. He had that same thing. He didn't have depression, but he came to a point in his life where he thought it was devastating. I will never escape this. I cannot overcome it. The best thing I can do is end my life here and now. He was married. He had kids. He had a steady job. But he came to a point to where something happened to where he goes, there's no solution for me except to end my life. Many of you and a lot of your friends have been there. Happy marriages of 30, 40 years wind up in divorce because one spouse has been cheating on the other and the one that thought everything was great is humiliated, embarrassed, disappointed and their brain just starts burning fuel up nonstop. They're not sleeping and they think there's no hope for me. This is as bad as it gets. A teenager breaks up with the teenager and the teenager it was his first love, and now she loves his best friend, and he thinks this is awful. Uh, he tries self-medication by drinking beer, and he gets drunk, and then he thinks, you know what, I'll just end my life. I'll show her, and they do. Number two cause of death for, teenage, for people ages 15 to 25, number two cause is suicide. Number two cause for teenagers and college students, suicide. So what's number one? Accidents, stupidity. Foolishness. How I many of you should have died a half dozen times? And me too. I hated that list of sins Jesus gave one time. You know, wickedness, all of it. And then he says, and the foolishness. Oh, man, what does that mean? It means foolish, stupid. You think you can jump off of this and that or drive this or that. So anyway, not a lesson for teenagers, but I'm just telling you. Number two killer, suicide. Usually accompanied by alcohol or drugs and think my life's over. Nobody loves me. I'm a failure. And they end their life. That's where this guy was. Anyway, his name, we don't know it. His story is in Acts chapter 16. He's called the Philippian jailer. Acts chapter 16 is where Paul and Silas, you know, heard the Macedonian cry, went across the, uh, the bay, and they started a church in Philippi with a lady, a pastor named Lydia. First European church in, in, a, in the world was started by a woman, Lydia. I always enjoyed that with my friends that say women can't be leaders. I said, well, Lydia was. Well, yeah, she's an exception. How about Mary? The first evangelist, well, she's an exception too. How about uh, these ladies and these ladies and all those nice people, Paul? Well, I get your point. Shut up. <laughs> so this is just one of those great ladies that loved the Lord, was having a Bible study. Paul came in, preached Jesus, and she said, that's what we're looking for. Started a church in her house. Paul's there and Silas and the gang, and they're doing great things, and then bad things happen because when people get saved, they quit sinning, and when they quit sinning, people quit making money, and then somebody gets mad, and they file a lawsuit or something today. Back then, they just killed you. And so that's what they were doing. David, Paul gets arrested. Paul and Silas are in prison late at night. They weren't only arrested. They were beaten just for the sheer pleasure of it. They're in the, co the, 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 in the cells and the stocks, and they're singing, and they're talking about Jesus, and this jailer's there, his job is to watch the prisoners under his care. Because the Roman law was, if you do that, you'll get paid, you live happily ever after. If you lose a prisoner, it's your life for theirs. No questions asked. They were a prisoner, they're gone, you're dead. That night, the Lord sends an earthquake. All the gates open up. The jailer, who was probably asleep, wakes up and, oh, and he looks around and all the gates are open. Well, if they're open gates, they're gone prisoners. If they're gone prisoners, I'm dying today. 
I'm not going to wait for that. I'm not going to put my family through it. So he pulls out that nice Roman saber that they all carried in the great movies we watch. And it, and as soon as he does that, this thing happens right here. Acts 16, 28. When you meet with people and they say, what does the Bible say about suicide? You're going to know. When you have someone that says, you know, I've been thinking about stuff and I'm just not happy. And what, what does the Bible say about suicide? You want to know what it says about suicide? Here it is. Brace yourself. Paul heard the Savior come out for the guy. He knows what's about to happen. In Acts chapter 16, 28, it says, Paul shouted, Stop! Don't kill yourself! We're all here! Would that get your attention? Lowest moment. And the guy you thought was gone says, Oh, no, 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 don't do it! We're here! And the guy's stunned. He can't believe someone's talking to him. He takes his light and everybody's there. And he just breaks down and he starts talking to Paul and Silas. He said, what must I do to be saved? I've been listening to your songs. I've been listening to your message. I need what you guys got. You're whipped and beaten and you're happy. I'm free. I'm about to end my life. Paul shares Jesus with him. The guy takes Paul and Silas out to his house, wakes his wife up, wakes his kids up. Two in the morning, you got to get up. This is what? We got guests at two in the morning. Yeah, I'll explain when you wake up. Can you make something quick? Uh, you know, tortillas, tacos, whatever you got. Let's put it together. These are really cool guys. You're going to like them. Paul and Silas are there. The man bandages their wounds, takes good care of them, feeds them. And the man's already become a believer. His wife becomes a believer. And the Bible says, and his whole household did. Listen, from two in the morning till before sunrise, this guy goes from suicidal attempt to new life in Christ because one guy, Paul, intervened and said, stop, don't kill yourself, we're all here. He could have said, go ahead, or shh, but he didn't. The guy that was probably in charge of the beating or did it himself was about to kill himself and God sent Paul as a messenger to stop him. That's what 988 is. That's what this is. How many of you are not going through clinical depression at this time. Raise your hand. All right. I prayed for you. I said, I don't know which is going to be more, Lord, but I'm preaching to both. So to you, you're Paul that does that shout out to your husband, your wife, your friend, your schoolmate, somebody that's always happy and all of a sudden they're not. They're always joking around, poking the ribbon. All of a sudden they're not. They don't have a fever. They're not sick. Nothing's going on. You ask how you're doing. They say, I'm okay. I'm fine. And you believe it. You know better. Shout it out. Stop. Don't kill yourself. 988 is the suicide and crisis number you dial. Do not dial 911. Dial 988. Let me hear you say 988. 988. What's going to happen when you call 988? I will tell you. You pick it up, 988. Hello, you have reached the suicide and crisis hotline. If you would like Spanish for parque, uh, what is it? Uh, see, what is it? Yes, si, eh, habla español, marque número uno. <laughs> yes, habla inglés, tough luck. <laughs> push one for Spanish. Stay on the line. If you're a veteran, push two for Veterans Affairs. If you're going through something now, either wait on the line or press zero. I didn't know if it would work or not. I preached this one time in a church, and I said, look, you call the suicide hotline, which at that time was area code and all of that. And I said, it's just like this. I had my phone mic'd up. Hello, you've reached the suicide hotline. Please hold. I'm in front of 3,600 people showing them this is what you do and what I get on stage. Please hold. Please hold. And everybody just starts laughing because, yeah, Robert's done it again, another failed illustration. That's why I use T-shirts. They're much safer now. <laughs> please hold. Please hold. I called this lady an hour and a half ago. Call that number. Just sitting in the back. I better check it out. 988. You know, stay on the line, and we'll get you connected with a counselor in, within 30 seconds. I love that. I mean, because this is that moment for you. It's 2 a.m. You're thinking it's all over. And you remember the funny guy with the yellow, the yellow shirt, 988. What's it hurt? I mean, you're planning to do the worst thing anyway. What's it going to hurt if you dial 988? And listen to somebody that knows how to help you. 988. Got the shirt. Take the picture. We get a voice. Hello. Suicide and crisis hotline. Uh, this is Kay. Who, how can I help you? I said, hi, Kay. This is Robert. Hello, Robert. How are you? I said, I'm great. He went, really? Are you sure? What's going on? I said, oh, I'm a preacher. I'm about to speak on suicide. 
and I wanted to make sure when I tell them to dial 988, they're going to get a real person. She started laughing. And she said, yes, I'm a real person. I said, where are you? She said, Austin, Texas. I said, well, I'm in Cumming, Georgia. How did I get Austin? She said, well, it's routed by area code. So I, I said, well, it's a 210. She goes, yes. And we talk. I said, well, I'm preaching on it. Just want to make sure. She said, well, it's not just for suicide, crisis or anything. Your 16-year-old teenager boy, your girlfriend broke up with you. It's one in the morning. You can't stand it. Yeah, call 988. Hello, how can I help you? My teen and my girlfriend love me. I thought we were made for life. And they calm you and walk you through it. They are pro paid professionals. They are licensed professional counselors. I said, Kay, if I'm in Georgia and I called you, you're going to help me. How do you help me? She says, well, I will transfer your call to the Georgia station, and they will get you resources and help. I said, that's really nice. I said, I was from San Antonio. She said, well, I'm in Austin. And I said, so people call, and are y'all volunteers? Or she said, no, we're all licensed professionals, psychiatrists, psychologists. We're here, and we take calls, and we will answer anything that's going on. You sure you're okay? Yes, ma'am, I am. Trust me. I'll, be, I'll, I'll give you a shout-out. Her name is Kay. She's in Austin. She's answering the phone right now for the Austin people. But I'm telling you, when that moment hits and you're thinking it's all lost, don't pick up the saber, don't pick up the pills, don't pick up the gun, pick up the phone and dial 988. I promise you, you will have more success with 988 than all the other stuff. Am I clear, yes or no? Yes. And I'm talking to children, I'm talking to teenagers, I'm talking to adults, I'm talking to you with a friend, and it's okay for you with your friends are out and they're just, oh, this is over for me. You say, hey, stop, stop the car, pull over. 980, what are you doing? I'm calling the number. Why? Well, it's because the man in the yellow shirt told me to do it. <laughs> and I put them on speaker, and you walk them through there. That's how you be the Apostle Paul in their lives. You help them. Someone's got to shout it out. Someone's got to stop, because when you're there all alone, you stay there. You don't jump up. I was uh, in the prime of my life at 45. Pastoring a church had started. It had grown tremendously. Uh, we'd built buildings and things were great. We had two full services on Saturday, two full on Sunday. Everything's great. We were way out of space, way out of parking. And so we decided to design a new building, 3,600-seat auditorium, you know, with great sound, not extravagant, but excellent, and uh, get it all done right. We had the, went around, looked at buildings, came up with the design. The architects built it. The uh, guy we'd hired to build it uh, priced it out. And uh, then we hired the fundraising company because we had to raise ten million dollars to you know for our share to get the building going ten million bucks a lot of money back then a lot of money now we hired the best uh, fundraising group we could they came in they did all the stuff and uh we're all we've got committees and people everybody's excited it's going to be great and then the last meeting uh, before the big event it was summertime so get through summer and then we'll hit the ground running in like september and we're in the last meeting, it's me and a few other people on the top team, and the fundraiser expert. And uh, the whole idea, if you've never been to fundraising, you love the church, you want to help, make a three-year commitment, you know, we hope and pray that the three-year commitments add up to $10 million, because then we can build it. That's the story. That's the way it works. At the end, we're in this meeting, and the guy talks about, okay, everything looks great, everybody's working, got volunteer, wonderful. And he looks at me, and he says, now, pastor, you know it's up to you to raise the first five million dollars. I thought I was paying you to do that. He said, if you don't raise the first five million, it's not going to happen. If you raise the first five million, then the people will get excited when you can stand up and say, we already have five million committed, all we need is five million more. He says, they'll give excitedly. But you've got to raise the first five million. I said, I... If I added up all of my friends' net worth, it wouldn't be $5 million. I don't have anybody in my church that has any kind of... What do you think this is? Coming, Georgia? <laughs> Dallas, Texas? Houston, Texas? This is San Antonio. We're the workers. They're all the owners. They don't come here. Then they go to Dallas. I said, I can't raise $5 million. He said, you have to. He said, you got people in your church that have high net worth. You know who they are? I said, no, I don't. I said, well, you don't? I said, no, I don't look at who gives what. I don't care. And so he said, well, you've got to find those big donors and talk to them, go to their house and do the dog and pony show and talk. And he said, you've got to get to $5 million or it's not going to work. You're going to have to redesign. And I mean, that hit me like a, you know, that wasn't prisoners gone, but it was pretty close to it. I got to raise $5 million. I hate raising, I hate raising money at all. That's why I paid the guy to do it. 
And he tells me, I have to do half of his work and pay him for it. And I got down. I, nobody knew it. I was just, okay, I'm sure. So I did my little dog and pony show, went to the people, said I have to do this. And they said, hey, we get it all the time. Go ahead. We'll have some friends there. And we did all that, showed the charts and how great it's going to be and what the Lord's doing. And I raised, uh, out of commitments of all the people that I knew, I raised less than $200,000, considerably less than $5 million. It's summertime. Julie and I went to Europe for our honeymoon. Uh, we honeymoon every year. That was Europe. And I remember being in, at Assisi, Italy, at St. Francis's Church. You know, the guy that never raised any money but did incredible ministry? The guy that talked to the birds, the guy that just... And I'm there, got the tour, read his biography, and I kid you not, one night, it just was so overwhelming that I got to raise $5 million or the whole deal is dead. We have to go back to the drawing board, erase it all. I got to raise $5 million. After seeing what St. Francis did with nothing, I laid on the floor. I duly said, you should make it a country song. I cried on a cold tile floor all night long. And I just begged God. I said, I don't want to do this. We'll just plant churches. I don't want a giant thing. Can't we just kind of spin it off? And I waited for the answer to the prayer. And the answer was, I mean, it's fun unloading on God. And I can tell you, if you unload on the Lord, you don't lose your salvation. He's very patient. I've yelled at him a few times in my life because I was really frustrated with his plan. It wasn't nearly as good as mine. But he's God, I'm not, so we had to go with his. And I'm on the floor just crying. Julie, are you all right? Yes, I'm fine. I'm just frustrated. I don't, can't do this. I hate raising money. If I don't raise five million, I just, uh, and this was our honeymoon. I would get back. We're all set. And between that time and the fundraising piece, I started going down because every waking thought was, I can't raise $5 million. I don't know people. It's just not going to happen. I got flat, but like the singers and the musicians and the actors and all of that, nobody in the church knew because every time I preached was on stage, we're excited, we're doing this, praying for that, hope you're praying for that, and I was happy, but walked through the curtains back there, and I was like the Wizard of Oz, a little man behind the curtains, just sick and empty. Worst of it hit on a weekday, uh, kids had gone to school, I was dressed and ready to go to the office, Julie comes in, I, I don't know what time it was, but... I was just sitting there, shoes tied, everything was fine, and I'm sitting there looking at the wall, and she says, honey? I said, yeah, here. She says, what are you doing? I said, I'm staring at the wall. She says, why are you staring at the wall? I said, because that's all I'm going to do today. And she said, what do you mean? I said, I just am going to sit here and stare at the wall. I don't care. She said, are you all right? I said, I'm fine. She knew that wasn't me. And she said, you're going to the doctor. I said, I don't care. Do whatever you want. She packs me up, calls our doc, Karen Shimatsu. Awesome doctor. Saved my life on more than one occasion. And we go to her. She says, bring him right in. We go in. I do the, the extended version of that test and talk to her and tell her what's going on. And told her I just, all of those. I mean, I, was like, I wasn't suicidal, but I probably wasn't too many weeks away from that, thinking if I die, at least... Julie's commitment could be my life insurance. It'd be a great thing. Yeah, just what the church needs, a dead pastor. I told her, and she said, you're clinically depressed. And I said, oh, no, no, I'm good. She says, no, you're not. You're a pastor. You're a leader. You help other people. We don't get depressed. We pray it out. We fast it out. We sing it out. We worship it out. We get it out. We don't need anybody. And there I was sitting there staring at the wall. She said, you're depressed. I said, what do I do? And she said, Robert, your brain is like a chemistry lab. And she said, you're burning up the stuff. She said, we have to figure out what chemicals you're missing, find the medication that works for that, and get you balanced out. She said, first of all, you got to start sleeping, because I wasn't. I'd go to bed at 11 o'clock, wake up at 2, and I'd say, Lord, I'm going to give you 20 minutes to put me back to sleep. If it doesn't happen, then I'm assuming you want me to get up and go to work. Anybody pray a prayer like that when you're getting up at 2 in the morning? Yeah, I mean, you get up from 2.30 to 6. It is the best time to work. There are no calls, no texts, no emails. You can just sit there and focus and do your thing. But you don't sleep. So you're losing that rebuild, reboot. Anyway, she's got that fixed. And then she said, I want you to start uh, this anti-depression med. And I said, what is it? She told me, I 
didn't know anything about that. I said, You're not, I'm not going to go loopy or anything like that. No, no, no. A new generation, just try it. And I did. I was taking it. A couple of weeks later, she called. I have a doctor that cares enough to call and see how you're doing. That's a blessing. If you're a doctor, be that doctor that calls to care enough. Because doctors know when you're that depressed, you're not too far away from saying, you know, the world would be better off without me. She called me up. Called Julie, actually. I wasn't taking calls. <laughs> And she said, how's he doing? I said, well, here. And she said, how are you, how's it working? I said, well, Karen, it's really good. I'm just moving along. Don't really care about anything. House is on fire. Kids are inside. That's all right. <laughs> she said, whoa. She said, you need to stop that one. I said, okay, if you say so. She said, put me on something else. Check back in in a couple of weeks. Robert, how you doing? Hey, Karen, I'm doing great. Man, everything's great. I got more energy than I've ever had in a long time. This is really great. I don't care if we raise five, eight or nine. It's going great. She goes, that doesn't sound like you. I said, oh, I'm fine. She said, stop taking that. <laughs> yes, ma'am. She put me on something else. A few weeks later, she called Julie, and I hear Julie say, he seems fine. Put, him, put me on. How you doing? I said, I'm fine. I'm sleeping at night. I'm working in the day. I'm, I'm this, I feel normal. I'm not, nothing is not loopy or high or buzzed or anything. She says, that's your pill. I said, okay. I said, how long do I take it? She, <laughs> she said, how long do you plan to pastor a large church? I said, well, no, I'm not going to do that. She goes, Robert, you're 45 years old. Your body is getting old. You got more stress on it than ever, and you're thinking and acting like you're a 30 or 35-year-old. She said, your brain has to have these things to balance you out. It doesn't produce it. If you quit and retire and slow it down, it'll work. But if you don't, she said, and I said, okay. So I stayed on it. It worked. I know a lot of you think, what's the pill? What's the pill? It doesn't matter. Go to your doctor. They'll help you. There's some medicines that if you're a driver or a pilot, you can't take it. But there's other stuff. There's all natural. There's a lot of things out there to help. Maybe you need a counselor. Maybe you need a psychiatrist. Maybe you need some of that. For me, it was that little pill. I called it my happy pastor pill. <laughs> Julie made me keep it by my toothbrush. Every morning, I had to shake the pill. I got it, boss, taking the pill. And I preached on it at my church. I said, it's the happy pastor pill. What is it? No, I'm not telling you what it is. It may not be your happy pastor pill. It might be your neurotic pill. You talk to your doctor. You walk through it. You stay with the program. Stop. Don't kill yourself. We're all here. Get some help. Follow the plan. Stay in touch with whoever's guiding you through it, whether it's the counselor or sponsor or whatever you might have. The key is stay in touch. And if you will do that and that, then you will have this. How many of you would like this? The skinny, happy face. Say I. How many of you will be honest and say, you know, I'm really more of that happy face? Say I. There you go. I've been working on that for this illustration for a long time. There it is. Oh, I forgot to tell the early church this, so you tell them. What happened with the fundraiser? I did not raise $5 million. I didn't even raise $200,000. But thanks to the Lord, a wonderful doctor, brilliant people who've invented medicines, I was going into my crucifixion, you know, with an open mind. <laughs> okay, it was a little weird design a building. So anyway, we do the fundraisers and all that. And again, the last words my expert told me was, Pastor, it's up to you. If you don't get the five, first five million, it's not going to happen. I said, we just have a lot of regular people. We don't have executives and million dollars. And so I'm dreading it. And the cards come in, and we all have the meeting, and he adds it all up. And he's shaking his head. I thought, oh, here it comes. Here it comes. And he said, uh, we've never seen this before. I said, what, what? He said, well, uh, you had like 2,000 people commit like an average of five or five to 10,000 for the next three years. You do the math, 2,000 households, you know, given, you know, 5,000 was uh, 10 million. And we raised, a, <laughs> we raised a whole lot more than $10 million. And he looked at me and said, Pastor, I don't know how this happened. We've never seen this before where the pastor didn't raise the first half. I said, I told you, they're normal, wonderful people. They don't have millions. They'll commit three, five, maybe 10,000, but they don't have it. I said, I know them. We designed a practical building. He said, well, this is a first for me. I said, and the last for me. <laughs> Never hired another fundraiser. My next fundraiser was called the Andy Jackson Campaign. 
As you leave church today, drop Andy Jackson a $20 bill in the box. That's the Andy Jackson. Every time you pass that box, nowadays it would be the Ben Franklin campaign. But back then, it was Andy Jackson. I've never hired another fundraiser because I know what they're going to say to the pastor. Pastor, it's up to you to raise that first $5 million. I lived happily ever after. We built the building. It grew. Everything was great. I retired at 60. I'm happy. Am I still on my meds? Yes, I am. Half a dose, but I am. I tried getting off of it like all of you will. You know, you take it and you always, those of you that get the antibiotic and you take a half a week, half a supply and you're feeling better, so you think, I'll save the second half for next time. Yeah, look at that, look at that. That's me, yeah, you stupid. <laughs> Didn't your doc say, take it all until it's finished? Well, yeah, but I feel fine. Take it all. I don't care if you're dancing on the moon. Take it all. I didn't, but I'm telling you, that's what you should do. I wanted to see if I really needed the medicine anymore. So on several occasions, I would not take it for a few weeks. And I'm thinking, hey, nobody's noticed. And then my best friend, Pat Betsy Bueller, she's a media pastor, she would call Julie, hey, is Robert taking his meds? And uh, cause I'd preach it to the whole church. They knew I was on the happy pastor pill. Is Robert taking his happy pastor pill? And Julie said, oh, yeah, I'm sure he is. And Betsy said, why don't you go in there and count how many he's got in the bottle and see where he's at. And Julie comes back, that stinker, he's not been taking it. And then Betsy gets on me. I mean, I have a lot of people that, are you taking happy pastor? Pill? Yes. You're not eating like you used to. I'm fat. I'm trying to lose weight. I'm not <laughs> depressed. You're irritable. You're grumpy. Yes, that's my nature, but I'm not depressed. I'm always that toy. So you get it? Stop, don't kill yourself. Stop, don't do whatever you're thinking about doing. Stop, we're all here. Get some help. Follow through with the plan, the counseling, the exercise, the diet, the medication, whatever works. You are too important to the earth, to the kingdom of God to check out. When it is time for you to go, trust me, God knows how to get you out of here. He does not need your help. Repeat that. Man, that's classic, and all the people that were going to hear it are gone. So you tell it to them. Cut it out, make it a little sound bite. God does not need your help. When it's time for you to die, he will provide it. There are a thousand ways to go. Some fun, some not. But God doesn't need you ending your life. You're important on the earth. Oh, by the way, freebie too. People always, we heard that you commit suicide, you go to hell. No, you don't. Your last act on earth does not define who you are in life or where you spend eternity. You say, well, I've heard that. I know the Catholic Church taught it, and a lot of us preachers do. Why? Because if we tell you it's okay to kill yourself, you're going to heaven. You, you realize how that plays out? Man, oh, the preacher said I can go to heaven. <clears throat> it's over. No. God doesn't want us. I've, I've told people, I said, you know, you're not going to hell, but I'm not sure I'd want to end my life and be talking to Jesus the next second explaining, hey, and the Lord said, well, wait, you're not due up here for another 32 years. Well, you know, it was really tough down there. Don't you remember the guy in the yellow shirt? Oh, yeah, that guy. Oh, should I listen to him? Yeah. Can I go back? No, nope, too late. You're here. <laughs> but pass the good news on. Stop. Don't kill yourself. You're valuable to the kingdom. Get help. Listen, follow through, and you will have the happy face that you desire. I'm living proof of that. Amen? The guy became a Christian that night. He went from the worst moment of his life to a new life in Christ. You can do that too. I know most of you are probably believers. My guess is some of you are here and you didn't even know you are supposed to be here. You just showed up by accident. But like I say, God divinely appoints things. And the message is this. You trust Jesus. You read the New Testament. You do what it says. And that will change your life. If that's something that sounds good to you, then ask Jesus to be your Lord. You so don't have to go to Bible study, but they're great, but that doesn't make you a Christian. You don't have to understand the whole Bible. You don't have to even know the 12 names of the disciples of Jesus. But what you need to know is you've sinned. You're guilty of sin just like David. Jesus died for your sins and forgives you, but you have to accept it. You have to sign the contract that says, I accept the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And then you have that new life in Christ. The word of God comes alive. The spirit is in you. You begin to see things that you never saw. It starts with you making Jesus as Lord. What did the Philippian jailer say moments before, after he was about to kill himself? He said, what must I do to be saved? And they said, trust in the name of Jesus Christ and you and your household will be.
Let's pray. Lord, you've made salvation easy for all of us to preach it and to accept it. Whether we're children, teenagers, or adults, forgiveness is like the apple on the tree, the fruit on the tree. It's just ready to be received. And I pray for anybody in this room that's ready to say, I accept that for myself. Pray this prayer with me and make this your confession that Jesus is now Lord of your life, and he will be. Believers, I'd like you to say it out loud too. Let's say it together. Lord Jesus, today I trust you. I accept your forgiveness for all my sins. Fill me with your spirit. Teach me from your word. And give me the power to live for you from here to eternity. Thank you for my salvation. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer and you really meant it, you go, does that mean I'm a Christian? Yes. If you really meant it, it does. What do I do next? Uh, well, I'd write it in your Bible or text somebody you know that's a Christian that's been praying for you. say, hey, I went to church today and a funny guy in a yellow shirt told me about Jesus and I accept it. Write it down. Tell somebody. Go out to the Welcome Center here and just say, hey, I'm a new Christian. What do I do next? They've got, this church does an awesome job of taking new believers, making them disciples in groups. Read the New Testament. And even if nobody else helps you, start with Matthew and just see what Jesus wants you to do. It's a new day. Remember, if you're going through it, get help. If you're not going through it, then be looking for somebody this week, especially at Thanksgiving, and find that person that's not themselves. Take them aside and ask them, what's going on? Tell me the whole story. You'd be amazed how open and honest people are when they know somebody cares and will listen. And then at last, if you have to, just say, let's call 988 and talk to the people together. That's it. That's my message. Have a great week. I love you. Wonderful Thanksgiving. Bye. Before you go today, just uh, just wanted to say you guys are so good at taking next steps around here, and hopefully you're listening to what Robert was saying. And if you need to pray with somebody, you can pray with our prayer team. They'll be right down here, or you can go out to guest services. Um, but before you go, uh, would you take a couple of cards on your way out? And if you love what's going on here at local church, invite some other people to join you. That's a really great next step for us as we approach the holidays. These are invite cards to our Thanksgiving Eve, <laughs> Thanksgiving Eve, <laughs> Christmas Eve service. So please take a couple and hand them to your friends, your neighbors, or your family. We'd love to see you. Hope